Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. I know it's raining outside, but we can be awake and excited and lively in here. Um, I'm Michael Barr. I'm the dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the Ford School, uh, to welcome our wonderful uh, panelists. We're going to hear from four uh, distinguished career diplomats on the topic of the U.S., Iran, and security in the Persian Gulf. Uh, not a small uh, or uncomplicated topic. Uh, the director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center, my colleague John Chachari, will introduce our honored guests in just a minute. Uh, before he does that, I want to just say a few words of welcome and a few words about the Wiser Diplomacy Center. Today's event is the final event in our semester-long series uh, that has officially launched the Wiser Diplomacy Center here at the Ford School. Briefly, the mission of the Wiser Diplomacy Center is to provide practical training to students interested in international affairs, to inform research on topics related to diplomacy, and to serve as a hub for the University of Michigan's engagement with the foreign policy community. The Wiser Diplomacy Center launch series has brought an amazing array of visitors here to the Ford School over the course of this semester. We've hosted two former Secretaries of State, a former Assistant Secretary of State, a former Ambassador to the United Nations, former National Security Advisor, and the current U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, who was recently nominated to serve as Deputy Secretary of State. So not a, not a bad lineup, even before today. Um, <laughs> We have a wonderful um, a panel for um, today, of course, as well. And as I said, John will introduce the speakers more in detail. The Wiser Diplomacy Center series I've just described, uh, I think, elevated the caliber of discussion about diplomacy and about foreign policy uh, here at the University of Michigan. And it, uh, frankly, elevated the Ford School's profile in broader circles of policymaking and among diplomats in Washington, D.C., and around the world. For making all of this possible, I want to offer my deepest uh, gratitude to uh, Ambassador and uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Weiser, Ambassador Ron Weiser and Mrs. Eileen Weiser, uh, who are here with us uh, today, uh, and to their entire family um, for their generous gift and for their vision of this amazing program here at the Ford School. So please uh, join me in thanking Ron and Eileen. Uh, many of you will know that Ron served as U.S. Ambassador to Slovakia, and Eileen served alongside him uh, in their time in Bratislava, and they are both uh, passionately committed to the importance of diplomacy and to the men and women who serve our country abroad. We're grateful for their friendship and strong support of the Ford School and, more broadly, of the University of Michigan. Ron and Eileen, the success of this launch series has, I hope, reflected the legacy of your work and the great gift you've given to our community. And as I said, we are deeply grateful. You will note that today's event and the rest of the launch series was also hosted as part of the Ford School's Conversations Across Difference initiative, bringing people from lots of different political backgrounds and perspectives um, here to the Ford School to talk about foreign policy. Practicing, practicing diplomacy both abroad and here at home is essential for working through moments where differences seem insurmountable. The art of talking and of listening across political and other differences is critical for advancing public policy and diplomacy alike. With that, let me turn things over to John, who will introduce our panel. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I would like first also to add my thanks to the Weiser family, as well as to the American Academy of Diplomacy, uh, with which we've been fortunate to partner to bring uh, today's event together. The topic we're going to address is obviously timely and extremely important. Uh, we're going to talk about U.S.-Iran relations, the nuclear deal, politics and security in the Gulf more generally, and of course, those issues are linked to a whole range of other uh, regional issues relevant to U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, from Israel and the Palestinian territories to the conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan, and beyond. Uh, and 
to have a discussion on such an important and wide-ranging array of issues, we have assembled a real dream team of diplomats with experience in the region. I'm going to introduce them briefly, uh, and trust me, uh, introducing them in a time-efficient manner requires a lot of distillation of their, of their incredible accomplishments across decades in U.S. Foreign Service. I'm going to start on my left your right uh, with Ambassador Gerald Firestein, who is a 41-year uh, uh, career veteran in the U.S. Foreign Service, now retired. He was ambassador to Yemen during the Obama administration from 2010 to 13, principal deputy assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs uh, from 2013 to 16, and has had many other crucial posts, including deputy chief of mission in Pakistan, uh, as well as senior posts in the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau, and postings elsewhere in the region in Saudi Arabia, Oman, Lebanon, Jerusalem, and Tunisia. He's now senior vice president of the Middle East Institute, which, as many of you know, is a leading think tank in Washington. Immediately to his right is Ambassador Patrick Theros, who's president and executive director of the, uh, the U.S. Qatar Business Council. He also has a 35-year foreign service career with many distinguished posts, including as U.S. Ambassador to Qatar and adv as advisor to the Commander-in-Chief uh, for Central Command, which is uh, the U.S. Military Command uh, uh, with coverage of the Middle East region. Um, he has also been Deputy Chief of Mission in Jordan and the United Arab Emirates, as well as an Economic and Commercial Counselor in Syria, among other roles. Um, Ambassador Ronald Newman, to his right, is President of the American Academy of Diplomacy. Uh, and served three times as ambassador to Algeria, Bahrain, and uh, most recently to Afghanistan from 2005 to 7. He also served just prior to that in Baghdad, coordinating the polit political aspects of the military intervention uh, in Iraq at the time. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of ne Near Eastern Affairs uh, during the Clinton administration, and he's had other senior roles in the United Arab Emirates, Yemen, Iran, Senegal and Maine State. I think you get the idea. There's a tremendous <laughs> amount of collective expertise on the Middle East uh, and adjoining areas here. And last but not least, closest to me to moderate today's discussion is Ambassador Deborah McCarthy, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania uh, during the... Uh, not in the Gulf. Which is... <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, during the Obama, uh, Obama second term. She was also Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs and served, among many other important roles, as Deputy Chief of Mission in Greece and Nicaragua and as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Narcotics and Law Enforcement. Uh, she is going to take it uh, uh, from me in a moment and moderate a conversation for about 45 minutes with our expert guests before we open uh, to all of you. And for your questions, you'll see people going around with note cards. Please pass your questions in writing to them, and they'll bring them down to us, where Chad and Karuna um, will uh, select questions that are representative of the group to pose to our expert panel. So thank you again to our guests, and we look forward to a great conversation. Thank you. Well, I feel very privileged to be here and also to be directing and moderating the dream team here. <laughs> By the way, the dream team was the basketball team of Lithuania, but that's a separate issue. I won't go into that. Um, as you can see with the vast experience that they have all across the Middle East, deep experience from young years in the diplomatic service to the senior years in the diplomatic service, I wanted to start and the panel as follows, to talk a little bit about what's happening inside the region. Then we'll get to what's happening between the U.S. and Iran. And then if we have time, we'll put it in the bigger geopolitical context. So to draw on your deep history, knowledge of the history of the culture, and obviously of our bilateral relations, I wanted to ask each of you to talk for about a couple of minutes on the power dynamics that are taking place today within the region and specifically to talk a little bit about how Iran is perceived by its neighbors in the Gulf. So Jerry, would you like to start? <laughs> uh, thank you, Deborah, and, and delighted to be here with all of you today. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the basic elements of, of the power dynamics in the region are uh, particularly the, the competition between Iran and, uh, and the uh, major uh, states of the of the GCC of the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and of course between Iran and Israel as well. And so when you look at 
when you look at the, the uh, reach of the region, uh, what you're looking at really is the reaction of the other states to uh, what is broadly perceived as Iran's expansionist uh, pro uh, programs, its, its search for uh, hegemony uh, in the region, and the reaction of those states to what they see as the threat from, uh, from an expansionist uh, Iranian state. Uh, and uh, that, of course, plays into what we're going to be talking about a little bit later on in terms of U.S. and Iran uh, and the other states. So uh, three aspects of Iranian behavior very quickly. Uh, one is the ballistic missile programs. Uh, second is Iranian interference in the internal affairs of its neighbors. In the Gulf context, that means particularly Yemen and Bahrain. Uh, and then third is Iranian support for terrorism and how the region responds to those three uh, uh, perceived threats. Okay, great. Huh? You want to yeah. uh, thanks again, Deborah. Uh, when all those uh, threats are real. They are so perceived on the Gulf side. But you have to take in one thing into context. This is not a new development. Uh, Gulf, uh, I've talked to many Gulf leaders, all of whom say uh, that it was the same in the days of the Shah. Uh, we have been around in this area for the last several centuries. We've always looked at Iran as a predatory power, as someone trying to control us. So this is not uh, terribly new. In fact, <clears throat> if anything, for the small states of the Gulf, the problem in the last century or so has gotten much more difficult because there is now two predatory powers. One is Saudi Arabia on one side, which both has a dispute with Iran and uh, is seen as expansionist and hegemonistic by the small states, all of, all of whom have reacted in more or less the same way for the last two centuries, which is trying to find an outside protector. Early on, it was the Ottomans, it was the British. Uh, <coughs> the Gulf states were prepared to, uh, how can I say, give up a certain amount of their independence in return for their protection. After the British left, there was a bit of a hiatus because we were seen, the United States, the re remaining Western superpower, was seen as supporting both Saudi Arabia and Iran against their interests until the Iranian Revolution. Uh, uh, they saw Iraq as a valuable, not ally, but as a valuable counterbalance to both countries for years. Saddam Hussein's Iraq was seen as a plus for most of the Gulf states except Kuwait. Uh, and when we, in effect, took them out, we disturbed this tripod, their own balance of power. So uh, Iran is the strongest country in the Gulf far and away, and without outside uh, <coughs> protection would be the, old, the principal threat to the Gulf states. Uh, however, uh, this is not to say that there are not other threats as well, such as Saudi Arabia. Okay, thanks. Ron? Thanks. Uh, Iran, definitely a threat, although perceived differently, somewhat differently in different countries. For the, the UAE, even when I was there 20 years ago, it looks at Iran, it, you know, they've just moved up the ladder of paranoia, but remembering that even paranoids have real enemies. Um, but there are things which are changing in the Gulf. Uh, the leadership of the states in several cases has changed and is younger and is pursuing some more dynamic courses uh, and in some cases, particularly in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, breaking away from the traditional, very conservative, almost passive, defensive approach to power and sort of f feeling their musculature and challenging much more so uh, old dynamics. At the same time, you have a real doubling down of monarchies defending monarchical systems. And there's a tendency, particularly in the West, to say, ah, monarchies, old news, you know, trash heap of history, gone. We've done that too. Uh, back in the 60s, when Arab nationalism came in, it was, oh, these, play these people are done for. Wrong. They outlasted all the Arab national regimes. Uh, and they're, they are bidding fair to do it now, in some cases by doubling, doubling down. They've become more repressive. They're less tolerant, particularly the UAE, Saudi Arabia, of uh, various kinds of criticism while liberalizing the social benefits. So that it's a mixture of 
on one respect, very liberal regimes. You know, Christian churches are open, Jewish centers are open in various places, and at the same time, uh, internal repression if you get out of line. But they're all still pretty popular. I would say their chances of, of remaining are pretty good. Uh, you could get into various different cases and not, nothing is guaranteed, but the chances of them surviving in this form of government rather than they are not moving to democracy and they are doubling down on not moving. And for them, the lesson of the Arab Spring is this thing is awful. Look what happened when you pulled down these regimes. You got chaos, you got bloodshed, you got all kinds of disruption that is still going on and a lot of loss of life, and that's not a really pretty picture. We don't want to go there. And the last thing I would just note in passing uh, is, without trying to, to bring it out, is that these countries are very different from each other. There's a tendency in the U.S. to, you know, see the f smaller Gulf states as being very much, you know, they're, they're just little Saudi Arabias. They're all a bunch of guys running around bed sheets. Um, you know, but in fact, they're very different from each other. Omanis, Gutteris have better relations uh, with the Iranians. They have historical differences with each other. And I won't go through them except to say that the notion that they are similar in how they regard their citizens and how they work with each other and how they work with their own people, that the idea that that is the same in each of them is in fact completely incorrect. That's a good point. Let me turn now a little bit um, to the relationship the United States has with Saudi Arabia as we build up to other things. Um, we have a strong defense and security relationship. Many have criticized the U.S. for overlooking Saudi political and human rights abuses. The U.S. Congress attempted to pass a, revol uh, excuse me, a resolution to end American military involvement in Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen. This was in reaction not only to the human suffering in Yemen, but also to the Khashoggi uh, killing. Jerry, maybe I'll start with you. Can you give us an inside view of the U.S.-Saudi relationship? How does it work? And in particularly, how does our diplomacy balance security interests with our support for human rights in this part of the world? Thanks, Deborah. And, and uh, it's actually, it's a very difficult balance to strike because I think, as, as Ron said, I mean, we're dealing with with uh, political systems, with, with systems of government and society that are very different from ours, uh, where, the, uh, where the ability of the two sides to really understand one another and to, uh, and to coordinate and cooperate is limited. Uh, what we have with Saudi Arabia is a relationship that really goes back at least to the end of World War II, in some ways even before the end of World War II, uh, that has been built around two core pillars. One is uh, energy uh, and uh, recognition of Saudi Arabia as the uh, paramount producer of oil in the world and therefore a major uh, uh, anchor for global economic security. And then the other uh, aspect, the other pillar, is what we have done uh, with the Saudis over uh, the course of these past 70 years in order to promote regional security and stability, uh, partially in terms of building up Saudi Arabia's own defense capabilities. And uh, the second aspect is how we work with the Saudis to promote, uh, to promote uh, uh, regional security in places like Afghanistan, where we work very closely together, uh, all the way through to the Gulf, to, uh, to Syria, to Iran. So these have been uh, core principles that every U.S. administration has pursued going all the way back to the Roosevelt administration. Republican, Democrat, it hasn't really managed, uh, mattered. We have a stressful situation right now where we do have some significant differences. And, and those differences reflect particularly our different views about the rights of, of citizens, the interaction between citizen and state, uh, the rights, uh, uh, particularly uh, for women, uh, for, uh, for other human rights, civil liberties, uh, where this has created real uh, tension and friction between our bilateral relationship. And so the question is, how do you address that? How do you, how do you balance between the partnership that we have preserved for all of these years against 
uh, what has been this uh, kind of fractious period in our relationship. Uh, and uh, in my own view, and in the view of the Obama administration and now of the Trump administration, we need to look at what the core U.S. interests are in the region, uh, which are primarily the stability uh, and uh, energy uh, pillars. And to, to what extent or the other do you uh, then press on these human rights? My own view is that we have not pressed as much on the human rights side as we should recently. Uh, we should take the Khashoggi murder more seriously than we have. Uh, we need to correct that balance, but I also believe that at the end of the day, we do need to recognize that preserving a good, strong Saudi-U.S. relationship is important for us to achieve our broader objectives in the region. I just wanted to add a note, um, perspective I got in Bahrain when I was out there last because we tend to be very certain uh, of our moral rectitude as we look at something like the murder of Mr. Khashoggi. But when I was in Bahrain, what I got from a mixed group, Sunni and Shia, was, hey, wait a minute, we absolutely depend for our security on Saudi Arabia. This Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is undertaking absolutely critical reforms that are essential for the stability of the place. By the way, you know, you guys go on having your relations with Russia, even though Putin goes around murdering dissidents in various different countries. So why are you so hung up and in danger of destroying this relationship and bringing us into danger as well over one killing here when you tolerate multiple killings over there? I don't necessarily say that's the view you should take. I just lay it out for you to understand that there are different senses and different views of ways of looking at this thing. Well, I want to turn now to the U.S. relationship with Iran. It's been 40 years since the U.S. hostage taking in Iran. Since then, we've had no official diplomatic relations and no embassy in Iran. Our interests there are represented by Switzerland. While there was extensive contact during the long negotiations for the JCPOA, most communication today is done via press statements and announcements. Ron, you lived in Iran as a younger officer and also were the director of the Iran-Iraq office. You're one of the few who actually lived inside the country. Can you talk a little bit about how from that perspective with such limited contacts, how can we manage our relations? Badly. Quick and to the point. Okay, next question. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. We, we tend to look at it very superficially, as they tend to look at us, too. I mean, it's a very long period. There is, there is the debility that from the Iranian side, leaving aside the American perspective, that there are great splits in view within Iran. Uh, and there are people for whom the revolution, a key piece of the revolution is death to America, is maintaining the ideological friction. So it creates uh, lots of things. By the way, I had a great time in Iran. I really enjoyed the people. And people who continue to go and visit Iran tell me that they find Iranians as a whole far more welcoming to Americans passing through than many of the Arab states, although our relations with the Arab governments are much better. So if it pays your money, it takes your choice. Um, but one of the problems in our relations with Iran is, in Iran, as in America, you have a deep division of people as to whether you ought to have relations, as whether you ought to improve the relations, whether that's a good thing. So when you get into negotiations, you have there, as you have here, a need to show that you're really doing something that works well uh, in, order to, uh, in order to pacify your domestic critics. And of course, since the same situation exists here, that sets up a situation in which for each side, a successful negotiation is one in which they have to show that they've done really well, which usually means the things that the other side really can't afford to have you show in order to pacify their critics. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's not an impossible situation as the JCPOA, uh, the nuclear agreement showed, but it is a very fraught situation in which to hold out negotiations, making it particularly fraught when you have an approach that says, you know, we'll tell you what we want, and then we really don't need to talk to you again. Well, we'll also, at the afterwards, you can ask him questions about what it was like to live there. 
Um, the U.S. pulled out of the JCPOA, and other parties have remained in, although the EU has warned that they may with start withdrawing from the deal. This past fall, there was a report that President Rouhani and President Trump, with the support of the French President Macron, were moving to an agreement which reportedly included lifting of the reimposed U.S. sanctions in exchange for Iran's agreement to remain a non-nuclear weapons state. Gentlemen, what do you think of the prospects of the U.S. and Iran getting back to the table? Uh, well, go ahead. Okay. And if you disagree, all the better we'll get. All right. <laughs> I don't think we can do it on our own. I don't believe that the American government or the Iranian government uh, have any formulas whereby the two of us can, can get there. It's got to be what Macron is trying to do, but I suspect very strongly it has to be on a grander level than just France, despite it's glory. I mean, uh, the JP, uh, sorry, the P5 plus one is mm -hmm. probably the only vehicle around. Uh, the, all the principal members of the UN Security Council and the EU, in effect, trying to gang up on both sides. Uh, gang up may be the wrong term, but providing cover for both sides to come to the table and start talking to each other. Because frankly, I don't believe that given the dynamics that uh, Ron was describing, that there is any leeway on each side to make the necessary, even cosmetic concessions that would permit us, uh, permit us to come together and have a serious conversation. And what would be worse would be coming together with ec each side having expectations of the other and not having them met. And frankly, uh, without going into too much detail, I think we're heading for a train wreck uh, with Iran, which could be very damaging to the world's economy should that uh, in the Gulf, uh, because the, uh, what it would do to uh, what the Iranians demonstrated they could do at Abqaiq in spades. So I think it is, behooves us and perhaps the Iranians to try and get more international, uh, I can say intervention, make something work. I'll, I'll take a little bit of issue with, uh, with Pat and, and take a, a slightly more optimistic uh, uh, view. Uh, um, and that is, if you look at the Obama policy on Iran and if you look at the Trump policy on Iran, uh, what you would see are two policies that were pretty much diametrically opposed. The Obama theory of the case uh, that was affected uh, in the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, uh, was basically that if you addressed what was the key um, international concern about Iranian behavior, and that was its pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability, uh, if, you, uh, if you put in place an agreement to, uh, to address that, uh, then over time by bringing Iran into closer uh, relationship with the international community, addressing their economic concerns, doing other things, you could then set up uh, the uh, possibility of getting the Iranians to address these other issues that I mentioned earlier that were of, uh, also a broad concern about the missiles, about the interference, about support for terrorism. The Trump administration took a very, the, the, basically the opposite view, which was, we can't wait, we're not going to wait for the Iranians to come around on their own, they won't do it, uh, and therefore the only way to get them to move on those issues is to basically beat them with a stick until they uh, cry uncle. Uh, where we are right now is that we never really had the opportunity to see whether the Obama approach would work. Uh, the uh, Trump approach clearly has not worked. And what we saw with the Macron initiative uh, was an effort to, to basically begin the dialogue again uh, and to uh, bring the U.S. and Iran together at a table where they could begin to work through some of these issues. I actually think that they can do that. Uh, and it's very clear from both the uh, position of Donald Trump himself and from what the Iranians have said that both sides gingerly are interested in finding a way to get back to the table. Neither of them wants the train wreck that Pat is concerned about because both sides recognize that a train wreck kills a lot of people, including the engineers. So, uh, so both sides would like to, to get back to the table. 
And what we're, the period that we're in right now is the maneuvering between these two sides to figure out who is going to be the stronger party when they sit down at the table. But I do believe that they will sit down at the table probably sometime uh, before the, our presidential election next year. Well, optimism is free, so one might as well <laughs> indulge. Uh, 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 but having said that, I'm not quite as optimistic as Jerry. Uh, I, I, I would just note two things. One is the legacy of suspicion and distrust. And it's not only an American legacy, it's a huge Iranian legacy, going well back into the 50s when we overthrew uh, an Iranian government there, something which the, the Mossadegh, which they never forget. In fact, I remember my friend John Limbert uh, talking, who was one of the hostages, but who's been a real advocate of the two countries working together. And he has a favorite story of talking to an Iranian who said, but you Americans have to get over that hostage stuff, you know, and he said, yes, I agree, we should, but you have to get over Mossadegh. Never was the answer. Um, and, and in fact, the, from the Iranian point of view, they have had several initiatives of reaching out to the United States, both in the first Bush administration and later, and feeling that in each case we walked away and betrayed things. So I do not think we are going, I, you know, we will see. We got it's a bit risky for anybody to make predictions in a time short enough that you could remember. But I, you could see this. I, I think what is more likely, what I'm seeing is there is a flinching. There is a recognition of what Pat was talking about, the train wreck possibility. And that's not just the Iranians. That's also the Saudis, the UAE. And so they're tentative reaching out to, on, on various sides. How do we talk about this? How do we de-conflict? So I think it is, knock on wood, possible that we may avoid the ultimate stupidity of war uh, because there is a recognition of just how dangerous that is. And, and so there's this kind of tentative reaching out, looking for ways to, to lower the temperature to deconflict. But I am personally very pessimistic, particularly given the long history, and also this sense, finally, the Iranians had this sense of, hey, we made an agreement, and you walked away from it. So what's the point? Because you can't trust the Americans to hold to an agreement they make anyway. And then, of course, accelerated when you look at Syria and some other things with this administration of, you know, you can't even trust them to keep their own policy straight. So, you know, why get into this? So I'm very pessimistic that you will get to negotiations now. Someday I think it has to happen, but uh, not in the last year before an election, I don't think. Well, uh, yeah. If I can just add, yeah. uh, uh, d to defend myself, of not course. being overly optimistic, <laughs> I, I, with I don't want to be Pollyannish, uh, but uh, but the one uh, the one obstacle the one obstacle uh, to a um, a Rouhani Trump phone conversation in New York in September was the simple uh, issue that they were not able to decide whether or not a U.S. reduction in sanctions would come before the call or after the call, right. but the two had agreed fundamentally mm -hmm. to make the call, and uh, and again. Uh, you're absolutely right. I don't think that it will be an easy negotiation. Uh, we know it wasn't an easy negotiation in 2015 either. Uh, but the, re the reality is, whether you like it or not, the one thing that maximum pressure has done is it has inflicted real economic pain on Iran. And therefore, they have a strong incentive to try to figure out how to deal with us in a way to get sanctions reduction. <laughs> And I think, I don't think that they're going to do it because they uh, love us. I don't think yeah. they're going to do it because uh, they, uh, they really want to uh, get back in our good books. But I think that both sides will make the decision to go back to the negotiating table because both sides recognize that it's in their interest to do it. I prefer yeah. to Can have I, you be right. <laughs> yeah. I'm Can going I? to add one thing, which is I ran the sanctions team at the State Department, and the last time when we squeezed Iran, we also got very, 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 very good at sanctions. Right. So we have capabilities today that we didn't have last time, and they were pretty good. Yeah. So If I could, Pat, well, then sorry. off that as well. One is we are very good at sanctions. Uh, now, the Iranians jokingly say that they're offering graduate courses on how to evade American sanctions, but they, they have <coughs> more limited uh, capacity to do that. Uh, we, uh, 
we have dug ourselves, we collectively, we and the Iranians have, however, both dug ourselves into a public position. Pompeo's ultimatum to the Iranians resembles very much the Austrian ultimatum to the Serbians in August of 1914. <laughs> it is, you know, surrender everything and then have the leadership commit suicide before we'll talk to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't see this administration easily backing off it is my problem, and I don't see the Iranians trusting us that if we have the conversation, uh, that it will happen. I remember when we did have a, the first reformist Iranian pr uh, pr uh, pres president, Khatami, in which collectively in our wisdom we decided that if we were nice to him, it wouldn't work, and we might help the hardliners. I mean, this is partly the mindset that the Iranians are working from, that they see on our side. We're going to come back here a year from today, and we'll see who is right. <laughs> okay. Actually, if, I, we can, if it's a year from today and I'm right, we're not going to be able to afford the gasoline to get here. <laughs> <laughs> we may have to meet in a bunker. But <laughs> <laughs> the United States has a strong military presence in the region. We obviously have troops in Iraq. The Fifth F Fleet is in Bahrain. And I know several of you have served in the Gulf. UAE hosting 5,000 military personnel, 10,000 in Qatar on two bases, um, the role of the Kuwait International Airport. We have announced we're sending or have sent more personnel to Saudi Arabia, and we've also launched a new maritime security initiative construct in the region to protect shipping. But many of the Gulf countries are increasing their own capabilities as well. How does this affect power dynamics in the region and our U.S. interests? Can I take yeah, go just ahead. one okay. quick one? Uh, partly, there are, there are this rush to become uh, the owners, not necessarily the users, but the owners of the biggest arsenals in the world uh, is meant to buttress their ability to deal with the Iranians. But I think even more importantly, it is a bit of a power play between the Gulf, between the Gulf states. Uh, they don't trust each other. Uh, the recent, uh, when Qatar was blockaded by its neighbors, uh, the Qataris f felt, uh, I, I don't know with, uh, how much justification, but they were, they'd convinced themselves that the only reason the Saudis weren't coming across the border is the Saudis hadn't wanted to telegraph their intent by massing on the border. And they credit Tillerson with stopping uh, a, a Saudi ground attack. Uh, <coughs> Saudi, uh, leaving aside the quality of the uh, military forces, simply what's on, uh, what's on the books, Saudi Arabia is a much larger, more powerful country than uh, Qatar. And for the time being, so is the UAE. The Qataris, I think, see their military as having two real functions. One is deterring an attack by their neighbors, uh, long enough for the Americans to get there. And secondly, dealing with the potential of a breakdown in order. For example, they talk a lot about breaking uh, the breakdown of order in Saudi Arabia. Their nightmare would be civil war in Saudi Arabia if something happened, which is something they talk about a lot. Uh, I think the UAE's buildup of military force uh, is aimed at Iran and building up the UAE's weight in the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council. And my experience is the UAE has the same uh, sort of dark look at Saudi Arabia's own uh, pretension. The Saudis have been chipping away at uh, the UAE border uh, for, uh, for generations. So I think a very large portion of that is part of the jockeying for power between the Gulf states. You asked particularly about the military balance and how right. the buildup of Gulf states changes that. The short answer is very little. These are fundamentally weak states who are very aware of their weakness, although Saudi's got a little carried away. But the, the UAE has made a real effort to expand the quality of its military, and to some extent, I think, has succeeded and shown a certain ability for power projection effectively. The Saudi military has shown very poorly. Uh, it went into, went into Yemen, and it, it has really done badly. They reminded me when they went in of something my father said to me years ago when the Russians went, the Soviets went into Afghanistan, said every country is entitled to the Vietnam of its choice. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think the Saudis found theirs. But first of all, they are 
economically powerful and militarily weak. And we often tend to exaggerate, and they want it exaggerated. A lot of the buildup of supplies is so they don't have to, don't have to use it. Um, I remember reading once that there was a Bedouin technique of riding your camels in a circle to stir up the dust so that the enemy would be frightened by the size of your force and you wouldn't have to fight them. Uh, and there is some part of that still going on, I think. But okay. Because you look at them, they have enormous um, dependence on their desalinization facilities, on their uh, oil refineries. These things are all extraordinarily vulnerable to missile attack, as the Iranians have yes. just shown. The ability to have these societies really crippled very quickly in a war is very clear. And they have very small, very small populations. They cannot have a large military. They can have a lot of equipment. They can hire a certain number of mercenaries to help them run it, but they do not have the population base to have a strong military. And in several cases, they've gotten used to foreigners doing this stuff. So, you know, the Saudis have had several military experiences, including in the first Gulf War, and in none of them have they shown any particular military adroitness. The UAE is the one exception that has a certain power projection. We're talking about less than two million people in the whole country. Uh, so these are fundamentally weak states. The bottom line is they can get more powerful to some extent for their own protection, not to the extent that we can use that as a change in our relationship. Okay. I, would, uh, uh, I would say that there are two critical developments over the last 10 years that have driven uh, these decisions, particularly again by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, to build their own internal security capabilities. Uh, one was the perception, uh, rightly or wrongly, the perception that U.S. commitment, uh, U.S. interest, U.S. willingness to uh, carry through on our, uh, our long-standing defense and security umbrella for the Gulf is uh, fading, uh, and that uh, go, you can go back to the Obama administration, you can even go back to the George W. Bush administration and see a declining level of interest and commitment to the Gulf states uh, that has played out. The second issue is the collapse of the traditional Sunni Arab leadership, and particularly the internal focus that Egypt has had uh, since uh, 2010, 2011, uh, the collapse, of course, of Syria, of Iraq, as pillars of the Sunni Arab world. Uh, and therefore, what you've seen are two things. One, the rise of the Gulf states and their view that they are now responsible for leadership in the Sunni world. Uh, and uh, that is uh, exacerbated or compounded uh, by, the, uh, by the younger leadership, the more ambitious, aggressive leadership, uh, that we have Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed in the UAE. Uh, and, uh, and so therefore, as a result of these two things, we've seen, uh, we've seen two developments. One is uh, that they are no longer uh, relying on the United States. You see that uh, in uh, both their turn towards a more positive, more, uh, more focused relations with Russia, with China, uh, but you also see it in terms of their decisions that they are going to take on greater responsibility for their own security, their own protection uh, than they did before. They're not going to wait for the 7th Cavalry to come over the horizon anymore. They're going to uh, take that on themselves. Now we can talk about whether they're good at it or not so good at it. It doesn't matter. The reality is that that's a decision that they're making and they're going to pursue it uh, and that has strong implications in terms of our own role and responsibilities in the region going forward. If I could add just one quick point to this. Uh, yeah, they, uh, the number of times I have heard semi-informed American commentators say we don't need the Gulf because we are now an oil exporting country merely reinforces this perception that when the balloon goes up, we're not going to come for it. And it's complete nonsense. It is way. absolute nonsense, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to wrap up asking about putting this in a larger context before we get to the questions. What relevance does the Gulf region have in the broader geopolitical competition between the U.S. and China and between the U.S. and Russia? I'll take a, 
uh, a swing at China, uh, is I don't think it has to be part of the competition. China is uh, very, very dependent on the Gulf. I forget the, the numbers. 60 percent of their energy comes from the Gulf. <coughs> if there is one country uh, for whom a major war in the Gulf would be catastrophic to their economy, it's China. And I am simply speechless at the Chinese refusal to get involved. The Chinese are simply, uh, maybe it's their, their, uh, their whole political history in modern times, they simply don't want to get involved. They have sort of bent, not completely, but they've sort of bent to our sanctions, our blockade of Iranian oil exports. Uh, they are the country that has the most to lose. And they're not doing anything. So I don't think they are looking for any sort of confrontation. I honestly do not believe that the Chinese see themselves as the new hegemon moving into the Gulf. Uh, Vladimir Putin is a guy who um, has played a weak hand very, very well. Uh, Russia does not have either the economic or the military or the uh, diplomatic capacity to really challenge the United States in the region. Uh, but he is a past master at identifying vacuums and figuring out how Russia can, uh, can uh, move in. Uh, and uh, he is somebody who has a vision of Russia as a great power, uh, who believes that Russia, by, by dint of its great power status, should have a seat at the table when all of these security and political issues are debated in the Middle East. So he's going to do that. But at the end of the day, he really is not our competition. Uh, the competition that the U.S. has in terms of the great powers is China. China is uh, eating our lunch economically. Uh, they are becoming increasingly uh, the number one economic partner for the Gulf states. Uh, that's going to continue. Uh, I agree with, uh, with Pat that the Chinese are perfectly willing to, uh, to uh, let us take on the hard issues of security and stability in the region while they focus on building their economic relations and uh, prospering uh, through their relationships with the Gulf states. But I think that that's also changing. I don't think it's an accident that the only two naval facilities that China has outside of mainland China are Gwadar in Pakistan, which guards the Strait of Hormuz, and Djibouti uh, in the Horn of Africa that sits on top of the Babel Mendeb, uh, because they understand that their security and their economic survival depends on access uh, through those waterways to the energy and also to the export markets. So, can I say there are no Chinese military forces there? Uh, there are in Djibouti. In Djibouti, Djibouti there are? There yeah, are in Djibouti. Are in Djibouti. And Gwadar has the capability. There's nothing yeah. stationed there, but, but they certainly have the capability of using Gwadar for military. Uh, so, so they are gingerly moving into some of these more uh, aggressive uh, positions. But you're absolutely right that, um, that what they want to do is they want us to take the headaches and let them take the money. Yeah, I, that no, worked. I, I, do <laughs> think, I do think what you're seeing, though, is overall a less stable world. Because I agree with my colleagues that the Gulf states are less secure in their relationship with us. And they are therefore looking elsewhere, and, and particularly the Russians. The problem is, they're, and they're looking to their own defenses and building them. These are policies which they feel they are forced to because they can't rely on the relationship they had with us. But they're not able to supplant that relationship. The Russians will sell them arms, but the Russians are not going to come to their defense. Uh, their own defense capabilities for all the equipment remain weak. So what you have is a relationship where we're not quite backing away. We've got a lot of troops there still, but we're they're unsure of us, and it's not very clear what we're actually prepared to do, where they're making better relationships with countries with which we're uneasy, but which in the end won't solve their dilemma, and building up their arsenals, but without the real capacity to deter the people they're most worried about. And when you add that all together, what you have is a less secure region mm -hmm. and a more dangerous one. Because when you, ha when you had the solid U.S. relationship, clumsy as it might often have been, everybody kind of knew where you were. 
and therefore you didn't mess with it. Now you have one that's very shaky and uncertain, well, and that has room for uh, mistakes. Okay, well we will now turn to questions. Ambassadors, thanks so much for being here. My name is Chad Dowding. I'm a first year MPP student interested in international policy. I'll be giving you your first question. How do you see the increased wave of protests impacting the future of the Iranian regime? These are the current ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Gasoline subsidy removal. Well, that, you know, it's, you want to predict the future. Hmm. This it's is easier really, to predict the past. I know. This is really tough. <laughs> um, they, they are posing threats. The regime is incredibly aware of the danger of these riots. <coughs> You're seeing the fact that there are social cracks after these years since the Iranian Revolution. I personally doubt that this period of riot will lead to that much change. Because I think if there, if there is one lesson that the older leaders of the revolution really learned from the revolution itself, it was how they gained strength as the Shah vacillated. And you had this period in the revolution where every, the, the, the Shah had put down a whole series of revolts before, but in the period of the revolution, he, he vacillated. He, use force, then 40 days later at the end of the first morning period you'd have bigger demonstrations and then he wouldn't always and he moved back and forth and as he vacillated the demonstrations got bigger and bigger and if there's any lesson which I think the older revolutionary leaders have carried away it is not to make the mistake of the Shah and so I believe that they will put these riots down and they have the problem they have a lot of force but they don't have leadership the revolution had a leadership in the wings ready to come forth and take hold. I don't think they have it. So I think you have something here that's analytically very interesting. It shows you how much dissatisfaction there is, whether or not after this you get something else. But I don't believe these riots themselves are going to lead to a lot of change real quick. I would say that, I would agree completely with that. The absence of, for example, a cool a coherent or, pro or popular uh, Iranian revolutionary presence abroad. I mean, right now we are, the United States has chosen to support probably the single most hated Iranian exile organization, the MEK, as the substitute. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they used to try to kill us, but now people like Giuliani and even former General Jones go off and give speeches for money. Yeah. Yeah, and the other, uh, uh, I, th I think I saw something today which said that they uh, have already killed about 100 uh, demonstrators in Iran, and I agree completely with, with Ron that they are going to do whatever they need to do in order to stop these demonstrations. They've been very clear, and what you need to remember is that the methodology that Bashar al-Assad has used in Syria, he was taught by the Iranians. That is really, it's the IRGC. Uh, that uh, went into Syria and really um, uh, helped Bashar use the extreme measures that he's used in order to stop the um, Syrian uprising. The riots in Iraq are much, have much more potential mm -hmm. for political change, but that wasn't the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you all again for being here. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> My name is Karuna Nankumar, and I am a junior in the Ford School um, undergraduate program focusing in diplomacy and international security. Uh, the next question that we have for you is, how do U.S. relations in the Gulf interact with U.S. relations with Israel? Um, in particular, how would a cooling of U.S.-Saudi relations, for example, with the bill to end U.S. involvement with Saudi Arabia in Yemen, impact Israel? Um, yeah. Uh, there, there was a theory uh, in, in the Trump administration that because the Israelis and the Gulf share the same concerns about Iran, uh, that, uh, that there was therefore an opportunity to actually uh, push forward on this idea of what's called outside in, that in other words, you could get the Gulf states to take steps to normalize their relationship with Israel uh, on this basis 
uh, and to open diplomatic relations to do all of the other um, uh, steps regardless of where the Israelis were in their negotiations with the Palestinians. Uh, I think that uh, what we've seen over these past couple of years is, um, is that that expectation, that idea, uh, was vastly exaggerated. Uh, and that while the two sides, there's no doubt that quietly under the table, Israelis and Gulf Arabs are working much more closely together, uh, that, the, uh, that the Gulf states are more willing to be uh, open about the nature of some of their relationships, particularly on the security side, uh, than they were in the past. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, there is a cap on how far they're going to be willing to go in the absence of some movement towards a resolution of the Palestinian issue, and particularly um, the, uh, what's called the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, which is basically full normalization between Israel and the Arab world in exchange for a two-state solution, a uh, Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the position, it is still the position, and I think that, that the reality is that unless, um, unless there is something that addresses Palestinian requirements, uh, you're not going to see the Gulf states go beyond that. If I could add one point, I've seen this movie before in the course of my career. Uh, there have been, I can think of three hi historical instances when American policy, beginning with the momentary cento uh, alliance that led to the overthrow of the monarchy in Iraq, where we were going to get Israel and the further Arab states, Iraq and the Gulf states, allied against the Soviet Union. And then we tried it a couple more times. Uh, when I was in Abu Dhabi, Alexander Haig uh, was building a, uh, trying to build a uh, alliance against, the, was, I keep even forget if it was the Soviet Union or Iran at that point, <laughs> but it was the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, again with the Gulf states. Uh, so we've done this, we've done this several times. We think that... But as we have no memory, it's always a fresh idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Next question for you. What are the most effective strategies for combating Iranian-backed uh, groups in the Middle East, such as Hamas and the Quds forces in Iraq? Hmm. Since we haven't seen one yet, it's hard to know <laughs> what an effective strategy <laughs> will be. Uh, Can I just say yeah. very simply one sentence? Uh, doing our best to fix, the pro uh, to fix the problem so you dry up the swamp in which they dwell. That, in other words, if you try to deal with them directly, this is their turf. They know their turf. They know how to survive in, in that turf. Uh, if we progress on the Palestinian issue, uh, I don't even know how to deal with Iraq. I, I couldn't even begin at this moment to suggest yeah. how we deal with the Iraqis. Uh, Iraq's an interesting case because the Iranians have gotten a lot of, a lot of power in Iraq, but the Iranians are not well liked in Iran, and there is, there, uh, Americans often have make the mistake of thinking because there are a lot of Shia in Iraq that therefore somehow <coughs> very close to the Iranians. And they forget the eight years of the Iran-Iraq war with thousands of people killed, the foot soldiers of Iraq were mostly the Shia. And they never changed sides. They never went over you know, against their own government. And in fact, when I served in Iraq uh, after, the, after our invasion, uh, you could be, it was not good for you if you were an Iraqi politician to be seen as too close to the Iranians. And now you're getting a lot of pushback. And the, the Iranians do best in Iraq it, when the country is unstable, because then they can work with different power centers for their own interests. They, they have always had the risk that a stable Iraq will be a threat to Iran again, as it was all the way back to the Battle of Karbala you know, yeah. in the eighth century. So this is not like a new thing. We keep reminding you that things are not so new. Uh, so. Right now, they have a hard time. I think it's. I think one can say that some things are things one should not do, are much clearer than exactly how to affect this. Ir Iraqis are really tired of foreigners messing about in their lives and their wars and making their wars, and so 
right now when you've got a lot of Iran backlash against Iranian pressure is a good time for us to kind of shut up and sit down and not to be very heavily involved. Consult quietly with people, but you've got a, a very volatile politics. You've got some things that are going in a direction that we kind of like. So don't try, you know, we have, we have a desire usually to do something. And this is one of those places where you're much better off right now Watch it go. You know, you may see an opportunity to do something useful, but don't assume you have to do something. Can I just uh, 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 one quick point, just to set at rest this question of Shia, uh, Iranian Shia control uh, influence over Iraq. If looking at it in theological terms, Najaf and Karbala are Rome and Constantinople. At best, Qum is uh, Canterbury. And maybe this not even. This requires a certain historical perspective to know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you all understood that. Yeah. If, 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 if I can, uh, if I can just add, you know, um, uh, Houthi, uh, the, the Houthi uh, experience in Yemen, and I think it, I think it kind of sharpens the point that that uh, Ron and Pat were were making, and that is that each of these instances where the Iranians have been able to establish relations, to work, you know, to, to build uh, alliances, relationships, is really kind of unique to that particular set of circumstances. So in the, in the case of Yemen, where you have the Houthis, yes, they have a relationship with Iran. Uh, yes, they, um, uh, they have uh, exploited that relationship, and the Iranians have exploited the relationship with the Houthis in order to uh, in order to achieve an objective that they have, which is to stress and put pressure on Saudi Arabia. But nevertheless, the issues that are uh, that are unique to the conflict that's going on in Yemen right now are issues that are internal to Yemen. The Houthis are not fighting because they are partners or proxies of Iran, they're fighting because of their circumstances in Yemen. And the best thing that we can do, to the extent that we can do it, is to help resolve those internal issues. If you deny the Iranians the vacuum that they have been very successful at exploiting, then, um, then you can uh, deny them the air that they need in order to develop these relationships. And that's true, I think, with Hamas. It's true in, uh, in Iraq. It's true with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And it's absolutely true with the Houthis in Yemen. But you know, the, the basic point that underlies all of these is you have to actually know something. <laughs> and you have to pay attention to the different situations and the differences. And you can't do this on the basis of kind of two-dimensional policy and sound bites about Iran, which is, of course, where we carry out our public discussion. You have to know about Canterbury. Right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that too. Okay, we'll go to the next question. All right, so um, next we have a question uh, turning towards combating terrorism. Um, can the Arab coalition um, of states led by MBS, considering some of MBS's actions um, in the region, uh, be trusted to combat terrorism um, in, in a manner that is in line with U.S. and global geopolitical interests? Maybe sometimes no. Mostly no. It depends on what terrorism <laughs> you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the Saudis were good partners for us, for example, in, um, in fighting against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, we, uh, we had a lot of success. And, and in fact, there was uh, one particular instance uh, you may or may not remember uh, uh, called the, um, the uh, printer cartridge bomb attempt, which was in 2010. It was right when I got to, to Sana'a, uh, where there was an attempt to smuggle explosives on board an airplane in, um, in printer cartridges. We would not have known about that. We would not have caught on to that had it not been for Saudi intelligence. And they're tipping us off and also the, the British off uh, about this plot. So there have been instances where, in fact, um, they were extremely important partners for us. 
There are other areas where we, uh, where we work closely together. But then you also have the larger issue, frankly, uh, where uh, Saudi policy has, in fact, on occasion exacerbated uh, terrorist threats and has made it more difficult yeah, uh, for us to deal yeah. with, uh, Libya being a good example. See, Next question concerned. for you. How does Turkey and President Erdogan fit into the equation? Um, Badly. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tur Tur uh, Turkey has a lot of its own agenda. Um, it's feeling its oats as it's moved into Syria. It has, again, Turkey has helped in certain areas. It has helped combat uh, extreme movements. At the same time, in parts of Syria, you have Turkey being quite tolerant of movements that are allied with the Islamic State. Uh, because the Turks are worried about other things. They're far more worried about Kurdish terrorism than they are worried about the Islamic State. So if helping works, they'll help. Um, but if helping gets us fight the Islamic State, gets crossways with where they see a, a stronger threat and interest, then they're not so helpful. Turks also are really feeling their oats on a kind of expansion of their influence. This is like round, this is like Turkish policy 2.0 uh, because they, they had this sort of same view right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. We're really going to expand. These are all Muslim countries in Central Asia. And they found that it was, the lift was way heavier than they had the capacity to undertake. Uh, now they're kind of trying some of that again. And again, I think they're going to find that their ambitions, uh, their, their, uh, their reach, I think, exceeds their grasp. Mm. And I would add that there is an internal dynamic. President Erdogan uh, came to power how many years now? His first seven, eight years in power were, fa were fantastic. He, you know, the best ruler, best uh, leader of modern Turkey you could possibly imagine. He really did bring made an enormous difference for Turkey. Someplace along the line, whether it's megalomania, miscalculation, or something, uh, uh, he, be, he has had problems. The problems reflect themselves in uh, election results, local elections that have not gone well for him. And like most guys who want to, like most leaders who want to stay in power, an occasional foreign adventure is not necessarily a bad thing, properly managed. OK. so. Uh, during your comments towards the beginning of um, this section, um, you commented on the potential of some sort of movement or lack of potential for movement um, in Iranian-U.S. relations. I'm wondering, what does the recent rise in tensions between Israel and Iran, um, marked by the Israeli Air Force strikes against targets in Syria a couple days ago, suggest about Iranian ambitions in Syria? And what is the risk of this turning into a larger conflict and kind of impacting this potential for change? I just, uh, when this is one of those places where I don't believe that the two countries really have an existential view of the other one as a threat. I think this is a large part of this is Iranian trying to uh, Iran trying to maintain its controls uh, or its influence in Syria, and in large part this is Israeli domestic politics because it's really useful to have the Iranians as as the boogeyman sitting out there. So <coughs> I. I think this is more of a hype inside the United States and domestically in both countries uh, as hype rather than, uh, let me rephrase that, I don't think either country wants to have a war with the other. The, there's no doubt that the Iranians were far more invested in the survival of Bashar al-Assad and his regime in Damascus than the Russians are. Uh, that, that for Iran, Bashar is an important partner. Um, access to Lebanon and to Hezbollah through um, Syria is incredibly important. I think for, uh, for their own reasons, uh, the, uh, the Iranians see the ability to expand their military partnership with Hezbollah um, uh, in Syria as well as in Lebanon is useful, particularly in terms of, of um, threatening Israel. Uh, the Israelis have responded. I think the an interesting thing is that the Israelis have responded extremely aggressively 
against Iranian presence. They have gone after um, Iranian arms depots. They've gone after Iranians. They've killed a number of Iranians in Syria. They've killed a number of Iranians now in Iraq. Um, the uh, response from, uh, from Tehran has been zero. Um, and uh, I think that that is, it's one of those situations, frankly, uh, where the two sides have decided that this is a game that they're going to play and they're going to keep it confined to this particular um, battleground and they're not going to allow it to spill out into other kinds of conflict. All right, thank you. How does the current state of U.S.-Iran relations affect U.S. diplomatic efforts in the country to Iran's east, Afghanistan? In, uh -huh. in, in, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Uh, What's happening in Afghanistan, the Iranians, it's useful to remember, were initially quite supportive of our intervention in Afghanistan. There's a big difference between the way the Iranians look at Iraq and Afghanistan. Iraq is a historic threat uh, to Iran. When I was in Iran, under the Shah, years ago, every year in western Iran, the troops had an annual military exercise where they exercised on the basis of the Iraqi invasion of Iran, the dropping back, the reconstitution of forces, pushing the Iraqis back. Um, Afghanistan's not a strategic threat. They, they get nervous about us. So the Iranians were very helpful uh, in the bond negotiations, in putting a government in place in Afghanistan. I think I had probably the last meeting with, we used to meet with the Iranians in Afghanistan up until 2005, I had the last such meeting but then was ordered to suspend those because we wanted to put pressure on them about nuclear weapons. I argued with Secretary Rice that that was a bad decision. I lost. Um, anyway, she was the boss. Yeah, she was the boss. Um, but anyway, they remained fairly supportive, very nervous about when we'd put troops close to their border, but otherwise basically supportive. They became a little more belligerent pushing on the Afghans during the period of Ahmadinejad in, in Iraq. In, in, in Iran. But now the kicker is that they are very concerned about two things. One is the growth of the Islamic State presence in Afghanistan, and the other is the perception that we're not going to hold up uh, our continued involvement in Afghanistan. And they can't, the situation is going to get worse. So, from their point of view, the greater danger. Uh, between Taliban and Islamic State is the Islamic State. So if that means that they need to warm up their relations with the Taliban in order to prepare for the expected panic departure of the U.S. and the collapse of Afghanistan, that's what they're doing. So you have a definite warming of relations between the Iranians and the Taliban as you have between the Russians and the Taliban. And in both cases it is premised on the two perceptions Islamic State is a bigger threat to me, if you're Russian, Iranian, and I can't trust the Americans to hold up their end in Afghanistan. They're going to walk out and leave chaos, and I've got to have friends. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, turning to kind of humanitarian issues, how concerned should we be about the human costs of sanctions on Iran for ordinary Iranian civilians? How, how much we should be or how much are, are we? Should be. Should be. Should, should be. be. Uh, if you're looking at it from a purely moral and ethical point of view, it's a little bit like uh, uh, our sanctions on Iraq in the lead up to the 2003 war, uh, in which we frankly, uh, we took a position that the humanitarian crisis that we had created in Iraq was the fault of Saddam Hussein, and we tried to sell that domestically. I don't think we ever managed to sell it. Uh, if we try and sell the same uh, story in Iran, I don't think it's going to be sold. Uh, it, uh, <coughs> the humanitarian, uh, we've caused the human, there was always been a bit of humanitarian crisis. We've exacerbated, aggravated the uh, humanitarian crisis in Iran. And with a few exceptions, I think the Iranian government will do a remarkably good job of convincing the Iranian people it's the Americans' fault. And that's, uh, and that's an, a really important point because, you know, one, the official U.S. position is that we, um, we are not interested in punishing the Iranian people. 
we are interested in putting pressure on the regime. But the reality is exactly the opposite, that in fact the, uh, the weight of, uh, of U.S. sanctions is falling on uh, the common people. And as Ron said earlier, and, and my wife is in the tourism business, and uh, up until um, we got married a few years ago, she used to lead tours to Iran. I told her to stop. Uh, but, um, but she used to lead tours, and she said that, that the Americans on her tours were always amazed about the warmth of the reception that they got. The fact that the common Iranian people liked Americans, and they liked America, and they felt as though, were it not for the political differences, that they would uh, be able to have a good relationship with us. Uh, the risk that we run is that we are changing that perception, and that we're building opposition, we're building anger against the United States among the Iranian population. And that's going to do two things. One is, it's going to strengthen the regime, because it means that, as, as Pat said, the regime can say, it's not us, we're not the reason that the economy is collapsing, we're not the reason that things, uh, that your life is so difficult, it's because of those Americans. And the second thing is that when the day comes, and it will come, uh, that we would like to normalize the relationship with Iran, that we would like to, uh, to, uh, to get back to, to uh, business with Iran, that there is going to be popular resistance within Iran to doing that, that's going to make it much harder to achieve our objectives. Let me add a qu uh, just a comment on sanctions. Sanctions um, are an effective tool if you outline clearly the behavior that you want to change. Mm -hmm. In the current long list of sanctions on Iran, and I'm not an expert on Iran, um, there is no desired behavior that's enunciated. In other words, we don't have a clear policy of what we want them to do other than, you know, denuclearize generally. Um, again, if you outline what you want to have uh, the behavior. When I say also, let me add another point, in, in fine tuning, we're able to allow exceptions and to allow certain things to go through, et cetera. Um, but the intent is really for the behavior of a state to change. The Trump administration, as I just said, has not enunciated exactly what it wants to achieve. So the pressure is felt, politically it is you know, played up domestically, and the longer they run, the harder they hit. Actually, there's even, I take the same point and take it further of lack of clarity, because the deepest lack of clarity, and this has been true for several administrations, not just for this one, America is whether we're policy is about change in behavior or about regime overthrow. Yeah, that's good. And yeah. as long as, and, and we send mixed signals, as long as the belief, there's a possibility that what our policy is really about is regime change, then there's no reason to make the concessions necessary because you're just weakening yourself in order, and you're setting yourself up for the next round. So the concessions, which we say we want on sanctions on, on behavior, it really only makes sense even if you wanted to have that agreement, if you believe that, what the that that's what the Americans are really about. It's not about regime change. And the way we talk about this leaves you very uncertain of what the policy is or what the policy will be tomorrow. And some sanctions are very targeted. I and mean, we sanctioned, for example, uh, some Russians in the context of cyber. It's very targeted, like stop hitting us, we're gonna sanction, and then we'll use more you know, offensive ways through Cybercom. Any other questions? Last question. It's between this and cocktail time. <laughs> <laughs> What's your advice on how students interested in Middle East diplomacy can best prepare to succeed? All right, gentlemen, with all your years of wisdom. Okay, I will, I'll try the, the first one which is succeed at what you're doing right now. Come out of here, do well in school, uh, do well, and then just get to know as much as you can about the Middle East. Uh, there, are, there is no magic formula. Uh, it's simply a, uh, a well-educated person who has educated himself on the region uh, and who has a real interest, not, as a, not just academic, but you need to start developing a visceral interest. Mm -hmm. uh, in the area like all three of us got stuck with. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the best way to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Did you choose it or stumble into it? Related to I that? stumbled. I, <laughs> most of my life I've stumbled into things, and I stumbled <laughs> into this. Yes. This, <laughs> this one I chose. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, actually, I had three and a half months after graduate school before joining the military, and I went out to visit my parents in Afghanistan. And that was really where I uh, sort of d began to develop a strong interest uh, in the Muslim world. I would say, I mean, if there's any number of things, we could all pontificate for hours up here, and that would really delay the cocktail. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you'll never be fully expert. You have to recognize what a colleague told me going to one post. Uh, it's when she said, you will never understand this country as clearly as on the day you arrive. Uh, because <laughs> you think you have a perception, you get into the details, you learn more and more, it gets harder and harder to make simple bottom line judgments. So recognize that this is a lifetime business. Uh, but that, that's not to be discouraged, but it means understand that what you come out of here with is a basis on which to go forth and learn. It is not a basis of knowledge sufficient to already proclaim how things ought to be. So prepare yourself, but the history, these are countries which have an enormous, and true of much of the world, an enormous sense of history. And this is often an impediment to them. It's really hard to go forward quickly when you're spending all your time looking backwards. But you need to understand the history. You need to understand where people are coming from. Then you go, and then you learn to listen. Mm -hmm. And my old boss, the late Hal Saunders, who was very involved in Arab-Israeli negotiations and other things, who, who really had an understanding of the psychological dimensions of negotiations as well. And he had a saying uh, which was, listen deeply enough to be changed by what you hear. Uh, and it's an enormously important point of both scholarship and diplomacy. If you want to get other people to do things your way and like it, you have to know what their way is. So as well as the history and knowledge, having a certain amount of humility and learning to listen and spend a lot of time listening is a, a good thing to learn. I, can I just add one slightly flip answer? Uh, very early on, I had to make a choice between studying Russian and studying Arabic. Uh, and I realized that if I was going to study either of these languages, I'd spend the next 15 to 20 years of my life in that part of the world. And frankly, I like lamb better than I like cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that uprising note, I want to thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.